Hey, party people. As you know, the Untitled Gen X podcast has a Patreon. But like, how does that work? What do I get? Blah, blah, blah. Well, Patreon is where you can get exclusive content, early access to episodes, official stickers, and a main feed shout out. Like, think, I don't know, VIP treatment. All for supporting the pod. With the Patreon app, it's just like listening to your favorite streaming platform while you drive, work out, do dishes, or sit in a parked car late at night waiting to pick up your kid. I know audiograms and little sneak peeks don't always give you the full picture, so I'm including a free Patreon episode here for you to try. I mean, who doesn't like free? So if you're into it, maybe consider subscribing. And if you're not, that's cool. Enjoy the episode. Either way, I hope you keep in touch, beautiful people. Bye. Hello, and welcome to a very special Patreon episode of the Untitled Gen X podcast, a podcast dedicated to the pop culture that raised us. As you all know, I'm Lori, a writer and pop culture lover who's thrilled to welcome back my pal and confidant, Jessica Ashley. Jessica's here to talk all about getting older, getting wiser, and taking less crap as we dive into season five, episodes one and two of The Golden Girls, titled Sick and Tired, aka Dorothy is Dismissed by Her Doctors. But before we get into the medical gaslighting of it all, I'd like to tell you a little about the extraordinary Jessica Ashley. Jessica is the divorce coach for moms and author of the Blended Family Q&A, 400 questions to spark fun and thought-provoking conversations. Jessica is mom to an 18-year-old son and eight-year-old daughter and wears inappropriately high heels to the playground. Welcome to the Patreon, Jessica. Thank you. I was for sure that you were going to say getting older, getting wiser, and getting golden. (gasps) And getting gold. You know what? I needed you to write this copy. We'll just be golden from here on out. (laughs) Yes, I love it. I mean, certainly we're like of the age of the golden girls, strangely. (laughs) We are. I don't understand. I just saw a meme the other day that said the um, Sex in the City cast is now older than the golden girls were when they were taping. I need to verify, but it tracks. I get into a little bit of math in this episode. We will talk about, yeah, you know, I do. (laughs) We will talk about their ages and what this means in relation to our own lives, because I have a lot of feelings about that. Their life seems comfortable and lovely and filled with wicker and, and caftans. And I'm here for that, but really they're a little bit young to be living so golden. I mean, we think that now. They were a hundred when we were kids, a hundred and fifty. But I don't, I don't even know if there's ever really reference to their ages. I don't remember that. So I think that's part of the reason why it's so disconcerting to hear that they were, you know, they weren't even ARP members. <laughs> they were living in a retirement community, <laughs> right? I mean, you just had a milestone birthday, Jessica. I did. I did. So did AARP come knocking? Oh, indeed. I'm holding up for my free cooler. Yes. I saw. <laughs> Are you using your discounts? I haven't actually, but my dad requests <laughs> me frequently to join AARP. Nice. And, and also he re-ups my consumer reports um, subscription every year. So I'm set. I'll You're be set. set. You're good. <laughs> Smart consumer choices. Yes, I appreciate it. Now, Jessica, you have joined me twice on the main feed for this podcast. So I'm so happy that you're here to talk with me about the Golden Girls. And so I want to know, what is your history with the series? Well, we were just laughing because... Without any understanding that I was recording this today, my my senior in high school walked out in his Queen's Golden Girl t-shirt, and I was telling him, this is prime college viewing for you. For sure. Um, this morning, he walked out in that t-shirt. It was su- such a dink moment. But I watched a lot of Golden Girls in college. It was, of course, in syndication at that point. I remember watching it beforehand. I don't even know. I think, I think this episode was 1989. Yes. So I was in high school. 
then. I remember watching it prime time. And then in college, lots of, you know, we'd watch like all my children, Oprah, Golden Girls, of course, nice. in the in the dorm room. So there was a lot of that as well. Now, do you remember this particular episode or story arc? Vaguely that it happened, but not the ins and outs. And certainly, you know, when I was 17 or 19, I wasn't paying attention to Dorothy having an illness or it being blamed on her age or divorce. I think at the time I would have, I just gave it away. I, a spoiler alert right there. But <laughs> well, I mean, people have only had a hundred years to see it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I would have thought it made sense. Right. Like, of course, of course you're going to have issues in your life if you're that old and that single. <laughs> You deserve it if you're that old and that single. I mean, come on. <laughs> right. Certainly her doctors thought so. Did you remember it? No. So I used to watch the show like in prime time. And I don't know that I was like a regular viewer, but I remember my least favorite character was Sophia, which is ironic because she's my favorite now. Absolutely. But at the time I was just like, oh my God, shut up, grandma. Like, I don't want to hear all of this, but she is often the, the Greek chorus, right? The voice of reason Mm -hmm. among these women who's just, she's calling it out. Like what is even happening here? You know, she's the wise one. I love her character. Now in these episodes, there are a few moments I was like, oh, shh. Sophia, right? A little cringe. Yeah. Yeah. A little cringe, but, but in that way, totally the grandma just saying whatever, but I had the same experience. I thought she was too cartoony and too loud. Yeah. And I didn't really enjoy Dorothy's character. I found her a little bit harsh when I was a kid. And now I see the value in her character. Mm -hmm. She's She's not as flat to me as like a Blanche or a Rose. Mm -hmm. There's, I think, a lot more nuance to Dorothy. But of course, I didn't get that at the time. Not at all. Oh, no, you're not supposed to. Well, I didn't. When you're young, you're not supposed to. But I I felt the same way. Like, whoo, she was harsh. Or, ooh, she's responsible. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas the others were just fun and funny. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, let's get into this. Sick and Tired Part 1 aired on September 23rd, 1989. And in this episode, we open on Sophia and Rose in the kitchen. And Blanche saunters in like Blanche does. She's all excited. She's got this great new idea. She's going to become a romance novelist. And she's decided that it's her destiny to be more than every man's passion, Jessica. (laughs) Her destiny is to be great. This is how she's going to do it. And she's like, my life is like a romance novel anyway. So I'm going to do this and it's going to make me totally rich. Dorothy comes in and Blanche is like so excited to tell her like, you know, I'm the next big thing. And Dorothy is not interested at all because we find out that she is really struggling in her job. She's a teacher. And today she was just so tired that she couldn't even talk. She had to dismiss her class early. And then she mentions, I'm just not getting over this flu. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, this just keeps getting worse. The ladies are concerned because this has been going on for a really long time. And Blanche is like, you got to go back to the doctor. And she's like, I have. And Blanche is like, you need to seek a second opinion. And she's like, I have. And everyone says, I'm fine, but I'm not fine. In the next scene, this is when we see Dorothy in an exam room with Dr. Stevens, you know, Dr. Stevens, who violates all the HIPAA laws, like (laughs) all of them. It's Jeffrey Tambor. It's Jeffrey Tambor, who, did you watch Transparent? Did you love Transparent? I wrote right down here. He's in Transparent where he looks like a golden girl. (laughs) God. He does. He looks like Dorothy. The caftans, the jewelry. Yes, yes, you're right. You're totally right. Do you think he channeled Dorothy in Transparent? Perhaps. <laughs> he was fired from Transparent for sexual misconduct. Yeah. There are a lot of cameos in this show by people who you recognize. Yep. 
Can we pause for a second to say, I did not remember that Dorothy was a teacher. And in fact, is she the only one who works? I think she is the only one that works. Maybe that's why she's flat. She's fucking tired and busy (laughs) and like she has real responsibilities that's why she's annoyed with everyone all the time like they've got nothing but free time well blanche is writing a romance novel right and no wonder she's tired nobody said well you're a teacher that's why you're tired right (laughs) you're working and you're 45 oh my god 45 (laughs) i've got one foot in the grave I did love the interaction between Blanche and Rose before we get into Dr. Jeffrey Tambor, where Blanche says that she's like, she's, she's writing about getting stirred in your loins. And Rose (laughs) asks like, where exactly are your loins? I, I did LOL at that. And Betty White, bless her soul. Oh, I know. I mean, rest in power. She could deliver those lines with a straightest face. Perfection. And you know what? You believed the innocence and naivete of Rose. You believed it. She's just so doe-eyed. Right. Which made it even more comedically brilliant when you'd hear her say something raunchy on a late (laughs) night show or something. Bless her heart. Oh my God. So good. So funny. That was a sidebar. Getting to Dr. Stevens. Yeah. He was horrible. I mean, he doesn't think there's anything wrong with her, Jessica. He's like, your tests came back normal. So just get dressed, go home and enjoy your life. I mean, he says to her, you got divorced and your symptoms are from not seeing men. Thoughts on this? Because she's like, "Um, what are you talking about? Like, I've been sick for like five months. I have a sore throat, swollen glands, fever, muscle pain, weakness, exhaustion. Can't talk because she's so tired. That's all from just not getting the sex? Well, and here's the thing. (laughs) Yeah. Not seeing men. I love how they veil Seeing men. Right? So interesting because there's a study that came out last year showing, which is, this has been shown repeatedly in studies, real science, that the happiest, wealthiest segment of the population are Single women with no children. (laughs) Seriously? I didn't even know. No, I think she has grown children. But single women continually register as the happiest segment. So I just think it's funny. It's interesting to see where we have come in this span of time and understanding that actually being married probably would have amplified whatever she was experiencing. That's fascinating because he tells her like, Unhappy people are often lonely. Therefore, she's unhappy because she's not seeing a man. And lonely people are vulnerable to depression and fatigue. But she lives in community with these other women. They share responsibilities, domestic responsibilities. They share the costs. They lift each other up. They are social connection for each other. Like We know now, looking at the situation, everything would have pointed to her being happy and supported. Much more than being married. 100%. I mean, do you have a plan with any of your girlfriends to like golden girls it out in the remainder of your life? They're not official. However, I do have my girlfriends and all of us are single moms. Like this looks like a much better retirement for us. We've talked about like, let's get a house and then we can be there when we can be there. And then you go to travel to be near your grandchildren or your children or to go on adventures. But That sounds so relieving and exciting to me. And I would love companionship from someone easy on the eyes, fun, smart, a gentleman. But I don't ever need to live with a man again. And I would happily live in community with other women. Look at Blanche. She enjoys the company of men regularly. But at the end of the day, she's got her house and she's got her girls. And that's all that she needs to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. It is such a moment because I don't think this could air today and for that to hold up. You don't think so? I mean, I think it would be called out. I mean, she does call it out, but I... mm. Because I still feel like, you know, some of the old school way of thinking. I mean, there are certainly doctors out there that probably still subscribe to this kind of thinking. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. 
the doctor does say she's older now, like you're older now. And it's not like Dorothy isn't vibrant and vital working. Right. She totally has purpose, right? She has a job every day that she goes to. She has much to contribute to society. And her frustration is that she can't do those things. I mean, all of that desire is still in her, but she's debilitated by this, but he just does not believe her. Can you even have imagined though, if you went to a doctor and they called you old, you know, so are you finding now because I'm finding it too. I don't like it when I see doctors younger than me, not because I don't trust them, but because I just have this idea in my mind that I want my doctor to be older than me. I feel safer in older hands. Because of experience or you want them to get where you are? Um, I don't know. Maybe both. Hmm. Because you would think like younger doctors have the more cutting edge information, if you will, and they're more progressive in their thinking. Like there's a lot of reasons to want younger doctors. Mm-hmm. Now I have a new primary doctor who I would say is 10 years younger than me. Okay. I really like her, but the first thing she said when I met her was, Hi, I'm Alice. You can call me Alice rather than her like doctor, her last name. Oh, I had never had a doctor outright tell me to call them by their first name before. So that was interesting. That is interesting. I don't know if that is that directly connected to her age or not, but I do find myself explaining like at my age to her, whereas my OBGYN is who I've seen for I don't know, 25 years, she's maybe, I don't know, five or six years older than me. I always just feel like she already knows. She already gets it. She's Mm -hmm. that step ahead. Mm -hmm. And when Dorothy was saying like that she can't concentrate and she often forgets things, I was like, yeah, same. I mean, I feel like I'm in such a mental fog these days. And I don't know if it's like perimenopause I don't know if it's just COVID brain, but it's kind of starting to freak me out. Mm-hmm. Is this something you worry about? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I think we are in a place culturally of multiple layers of trauma over the last few years. It is it is the pandemic, of course, and all the emotional and social parts of that, but also just all the worry about what could happen next on top of anything that's happened in your home. And the more you're in your home, the more those issues are exacerbated. And then on top of it, of coming into an age ages where there isn't as much information or support, even if you surround yourself with experts on perimenopause or premenopause or menopause, It's just like, it feels like a constant struggle to find information and resources, I think. And I just know with my coaching clients, every single person who comes in has multiple layers of trauma going on in their lives that they're contending with. Of course, that's going to change the neural pathways in your brain so that it's harder to concentrate. You're just in survival mode. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think in the case of Dorothy's doctor, he's probably just like, oh, I think it's easy for doctors to just be like, well, at your age, that's what happens. Oh, hormones. Yeah. Clearly in her case, there's more to it than that, but she's just so dismissed. He flat out tells her, I don't believe you're sick, but if you want to pursue this, go ahead, go to New York, go see this neurologist that I studied under. He's the best. If there's something wrong with you, he'll find it. But she doesn't ever see a female doctor. No. At this point in my life, I mean, I have a few specialist doctors who are male. I am not interested in seeing anybody like who's dealing with my hormones, an internist, none of that. I don't want to see a man. I want a woman who's going to get it and who's going to advocate for the best treatment that I can get right now. I really need that. I And I just think it's interesting in this whole episode, every expert is a man. So the question this episode really bubbled up for me was, have you ever had a doctor tell you that they don't believe you or like, no, there's nothing wrong? I'm someone who struggles with health anxiety. As you know, we've had conversations about this, Jessica. And um, I think my biggest issue is that I often don't know whether or not I can trust myself. So Mm -hmm. if I'm experiencing something, I don't know if it's actually real 
or if it's rooted in anxiety, which anxiety is very real and anxiety can absolutely cause health issues. But I don't know if like the root of what I'm experiencing is related to anxiety or if it's something else. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of trouble trusting myself when it comes to things with my own body. I've never had a doctor say like, I don't believe you. But one time I went to the doctor, I had a sore throat for like, oh my gosh, like over six months. It was so bad. I was on so many antibiotics and they just kept getting stronger and stronger. And this thing wasn't going away. And I went in just desperate and it was a male doctor. And, um, I walked in for my sore throat. I walked out with antidepressants. Mm. It fixed my sore throat. Mm. Like I could not heal because what I was dealing with was just so big and it absolutely was psychological for me, Mm. but that was a doctor who really like, he took a lot of time with me and he, he could see that what I was experiencing was very real, but in talking to me and taking time just was like, I honestly think you need to try this and it worked. So, I mean, God bless him, but I've never been in a situation where I've been like, I have this thing and I'm being dismissed at the end of this, I was trying to count how many doctors she had been to. Cause you know, we see three doctors here, but no four doctors, she sees four doctors, but then she had already, you know, gone to the doctor once gone a second time, gotten her second opinion. So, I mean, this was a long journey for her. Have you had anything like this happen to you? Multiple doctors yeah. not believing. Yeah, I have. And it's really interesting to reflect upon that and how self-advocating is so exhausting. And I think actually- And expensive. Expensive. And it exacerbates the issue. So there was a period of time, a very high stress period of time where I was sick for an entire year with a sinus infection for an entire year. And I was probably on eight rounds of antibiotics, Mm -hmm. steroids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on so many antibiotics and I just kept reading about like how disruptive to your body this was. And I was not getting better. It was horrible. I switched doctors because I just kept going. They're just like, just prescribing over and over. I got a new primary doctor. I went to that. It's not the one I have now. And it was a woman who was a little more crunchy granola. Okay. (laughs) So I thought, okay, we're going to look at this holistically. Sure. Okay. And she said she could not find anything wrong with me. And that the only thing that she could come up with for me was to have an inhaler. I didn't need an inhaler. Okay. It was a sinus infection. And that the only inhaler that I could use um, was not covered by my insurance and would be a monthly cost of $483. Oh. And she said to me, you're going to be on this the rest of your life. And I was like, there is no way this is not helping. I was so angry. Of course. It was the anger, I think, that helped me keep going. But I honestly felt like I'm going to die. Now, that may have been a little exaggeration for the moment, but I just felt like, how can you be sick? like a sinus infection for this long. And it was really problematic. I wasn't sleeping well, totally impacting on my clarity and my um, energy levels. And I went to an ENT and the ENT did a CAT scan and said, you have such a bad sinus problem. It was like all up in my forehead. And he said, you have to have surgery on this immediately because it's too near your brain and your eyes. And we don't want infection near your brain and eyes. So I had the surgery. It was a big deal. It was a tough recovery, but it was really him believing me and like, like, okay, I'm going to help fix it. I haven't had a sinus infection since. I mean, it has radically changed my life. And I think what would I have done as a person who's grew up to believe like you trust the doctor, you do what the doctor says, you follow their orders. If I had just kept believing the doctors, where would I have been years later? Wow. That was a big one. I think that was also like a few years before that. I knew I was having postpartum depression. 
part of that was because of what was happening in my home and that my partner at the time did not believe me at all. And it just told me I've been with women who've been depressed before and I'm not dealing with this. So it was totally on my own and I needed help. I went to my OBGYN. I ended up seeing a PA or something and they told me you're too functional to be considered as having postpartum. You and I talked about it because I remember reaching out to girlfriends and our friend who at the time had a website for women with postpartum Mm -hmm. and saying like, why isn't anybody believing me? And the answer I kept getting was nobody believes this. But really, I felt so proud of myself for acknowledging this is postpartum depression. I don't think it's scary, but I need help and not getting the support I needed. I needed the doctor you had at the time, whether it was antidepressants or not to just Uh say like, how are we going to address this? Let's make a plan. Yep. So I think those are two really like, those are big and serious situations. One of them kind of resolved. I resolved on my own. The other one, thank God there was an adept doctor and I had the fire inside to want to get better because I think if I'd been depressed at the time or I'd given up, been complacent, it would have been a very different story. Let's not underestimate the amount of energy that goes into doing this. And when you're exhausted, how do you muster the strength to just keep going and keep fighting for it? Thankfully, Dorothy had the support of her family and her community and her friends. And her mom saying, keep at it. Keep this at it. Not right. Man, that takes a lot out of you. She can barely get through the day. And it's 100% gendered. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up because I found today.com did a pretty comprehensive series. It's called Dismissed, the Health Risk of Being a Woman. And they found that more than 40% of women who were eventually diagnosed with a serious autoimmune disease had been told by their doctor that they were just too concerned with their health or that they were a hypochondriac, 40%, Jessica, of auto serious autoimmune conditions. And this is like, this goes back to coining the term hysteria. That's it. Yeah. But too concerned with their health. Too concerned with their health. Or you're just a hypochondriac. Like there's no in between. Nope. It's one or the other. Right. So it totally dismantles your intuition and knowing of your own body, which is so dangerous, especially if you're a mother, because you're already putting everybody else before yourself. Like your kids are going to the doctor and you're not. Every little cold, you're like assessing. Right. right? And you're on death's door. You try to fight it the best you can for probably way too long by the time you finally make it to the doctor and then to be dismissed or to be told you're crazy. It's all in your head. Mm -hmm. And for Dorothy, that would have been so radically changed if the first doctor would have just said, I believe you. I just don't know what it is. Let's figure it out. Yes. That is addressed to you. Like Dr. Ego is really addressed. (laughs) Yes, it is. So, okay, back at the house, Blanche has writer's block and (laughs) and she hasn't even started writing, but she's got the writer's block and she tells Dorothy like, oh, you're going to go to New York to see a doctor. Like, I want to go. I need to, I need to go for some inspiration. And Dorothy's like, look, I'm going to bring Rose. Rose comforts me. And, um, this isn't like a fun trip. (laughs) I'm I'm here to, to get some shit done and figured out here. So we're now in New York. Well, she's seeing a neurologist. Like, it's in your brain, lady. Yes. Dr. Bud in New York is a neurologist. And he is straight up chastising her for being there when all of her tests came back normal. He's like, what are you doing here? And she makes her case again, but I'm exhausted. We learned she had to stop working. Now she's not even working. And he's like, you're just getting older. And look, you were able to fly here and walk up to my office and you're not really sick. I have patients that can't even do that much. I mean, he totally dismissed her. And talking about that today.com article in a poll, they found that 26% of women reported that the symptoms of their chronic pain or chronic condition were dismissed while only 18% of men reported the same. And how much of that is like pain tolerance that women have versus men just biologically. I know. I know. 
So, I mean, gender bias in healthcare, it goes back to what you're saying. Like, it's a really serious problem. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I think you should see a psychiatrist. And I love that she came prepared. She, she pulled did. out two letters. From therapist. From therapist saying that she's fine. Fuck right on off, Dr. Bud. <laughs> God. And they were hefty. Did you notice how hefty those letters were? I didn't. Were they? <laughs> they were They were like multiple sheets, tri-folded in separate <laughs> envelopes. Well, I just kept thinking, I hope she has several copies. <laughs> Love it. So what did you think of what Dr. Bud prescribed for her? Uh, Take a cruise, go to a hypnotist, change your hair color. Yeah, dye your hair blonde. It worked wonders for his wife. Yep. Oh, wow. I, I do think we still hear a lot of this in healthcare. I think it looks a little different now. It looks like yoga, bath, exercise. Yeah. Sort of like the goop solution to. Yes, a hundred percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what that looks like for men. Like when they're prescribed self-care, what does that really look like? Does it look like take up a hobby, go golfing? I don't know. It's interesting to consider. With this Today series, they said 31% of women diagnosed with chronic pain said they had to prove their symptoms to a healthcare provider compared to 19% of men. So it's like women have to prove their symptoms almost twice as much as men do. How do you prove it? I don't know. I've heard doctors say like, do you, are you keeping a log of how you feel? Like when you are in pain or having chronic pain or chronic symptoms, you're not keeping a log. There's probably some merit to that to some degree to know that when you're experiencing pain, like what's going on in your life at that time, is your diet somehow contributing to this? Like, I feel like there might be some valuable information to be had in that, but I don't really know how sustainable something like that is when this is like a daily occurrence. Like it doesn't even sound like she has good days and bad days. Like she has bad days and worse days. Yes. Especially with the issues she's having doing an extra thing. Do you know what I mean? I've just something I've heard doctors say like, Oh, do you, you know, have you been tracking that? No, I'm like, whatever. In my case, I was like, I have a newborn. Yeah, <laughs> I'm breastfeeding around the clock. I'm not sleeping. I'm not tracking. I'm tracking diapers. I'm not tracking I'm tracking poops my level day, of day. sad. <laughs> oh, back at the hotel, Dorothy breaks down in tears to Rose, she's like, maybe I am crazy. Multiple doctors have said it. And Rose tells her, you're not crazy, honey, you're sick. And she tells her doctors don't know everything. And I mean, they don't. We want to believe that they do. That was a really good moment because we don't get to see Dorothy vulnerable very often. Mm -hmm. Even when she's sick, we don't get to see her vulnerable. But we also don't get to see Rose in the caretaker role. She is a caretaker, but I mean in that like, more confident, assertive. Nope. Doctors don't know anything that that's an unexpected line, which is a really nice moment. I really like why you would golden girl it up in a time in your life where you might be having a lot of health issues is to have your girlfriends there to remind you you're not crazy and who you are. Yeah. I thought it was really sweet. Back at home, Blanche is hell bent on finishing her novel, no matter what. (laughs) Sophia comes in and tells them you guys, Dorothy isn't doing well. The ladies rally around her. It's it's a very sweet and poignant moment, but we never see Sophia vulnerable. You know, we talk about Dorothy, but Sophia's like, I'm terrified about the possibility of losing her. What if she's dying and they just don't know it? Mm. This reminds me so much of, this is getting very deep talking about deep the golden stuff. girl. It's deep. My grandma who lived to be 102. Oh, um, bless. She had lost so many people in her life. Sure. I mean, was the sole remaining person in her family, seven kids. And when somebody older would die, my grandmother would always say, if life goes right, the parent dies before the child. If life goes wrong, it happens the other way around. I think of that all the time how 
inconceivable that is just because we want to keep living well. But even as in the show is perceived as an old lady and her old daughter, <laughs> right? how terrifying that is that her daughter's health is rapidly failing in front of her and there's nothing she feels like she can do. That feeling of helplessness is like this really present theme that I think in this moment in this scene felt like it really came to the peak. I think so. And that's the end of the episode. It was a tough one. And I think it took a really emotional turn there because there's the, the funniness of Blanche writing her life stories into a romance novel and some of that. But it really does take an emotional turn towards Dorothy just not being heard. And everybody's scared. Thank God for the moments of levity in it because it, yeah. it needed it. Because the Golden Girls... I have to say it was a really progressive show for the time. I didn't really realize it, but they tackled some serious stuff and Mm -hmm. through it all, they kept you laughing, but this one like ended on a scary note and they didn't usually do that. So it was quite the departure from their regular episodes, but part two aired the following week, September 30th, 1989. And we see Dorothy visit her friend, pediatrician, Dr. Harry, Did you used to watch, I forgot this guy's name. I I looked it up and I didn't write it down. He was in like sort of the loose spinoff show, Empty Nest. Yeah. Did you used to watch that show? (laughs) I used to watch it. You will recognize almost everybody from these shows. I know. (laughs) It's crazy. I'm like, oh my gosh, all these people went on to do other things. Yeah. So Dr. Harry reviews her charts and he tells her, Just because you've seen the best doctors, it doesn't mean that there's nothing there. Like, you're a stable person. If you say you're sick, you probably are sick. Woo! Coming through, Dr. Harry. Man, that was all she needed to hear. Even at this juncture, she doesn't have any answers. But that validation is like, okay, now I have enough fight in me to keep going. Yeah, it's the shift she needs. Yes, she's at Mm -hmm. her like weakest, Mm -hmm. her most vulnerable. She's exhausted, exhausted enough to see a pediatrician. I know he's her friend, but still, and it takes a pediatrician saying, you're not crazy. There's something here. This is a good opportunity to say, have a friend who's a doctor. Uh, Yes, 100%. I highly recommend it. Yes. I have a friend who's a podiatrist. Bless her heart. Anytime something's wrong with our foot, she's like, text me a picture. I'll tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Score. And I never would have thought, have a friend who's a podiatrist, but get one. It's good. (laughs) Get one. (laughs) Jessica Ashley endorses podiatrists as friends. I do. (laughs) Let this be your takeaway. I have a a very close friend that's a a DO and um, yeah, he, he gets lots and lots of texts from me. Um, Thank God we're very good friends because if we weren't, I think I would have soiled that relationship a long time ago. (laughs) So (laughs) I know no boundaries. So um, yeah, but Dr. Harry's like, I think you need to see our virologist on staff, Dr. Chang. Um, He's great. And I think that he can maybe help you out. And she's just so thankful to him for believing her. Mm. There's some grace there. But also, why do you have to thank somebody for believing you that you're sick? At this point, it's been like six months and she's out of work. Right. Like, that is radical to think like, oh, this is such a moment. And of course, she's so thankful. I would be the same way. Like, why do you have to see all these doctors? And then you're thankful that somebody just says, you're sick. If you think you're sick, you're sick. Just like with you, if you think you have a sore throat, whether the diagnosis is anxiety or the diagnosis is something else, you are still sick. You're still sick. And like, we've tried to treat it all these many ways. It's not going away. If it was as simple as a sore throat, it would have gone away by now. Exactly. You know, But that tells you where healthcare is. Yes. You have to be thankful for being seen. And you feel like if a man came in with those symptoms, he would have been taken seriously at least half as soon. All the panels. He wouldn't have had to go to New York to see a a neurologist for something that was viral. 
And she's at this point out of pocket so much money, so much energy, so much time. A hundred percent. So the next morning, Dorothy comes into the kitchen and she's got some pep in her step. She is excited because she's going to see Dr. Chang today. And, you know, for the first time in a long time, she looks cheerful. And Sophia's like, Dorothy, you look too good. Like, take off your makeup because (laughs) you look too healthy. And we want the doctor to believe that you're sick. (laughs) And this is like a total aside. But like, do you think you look healthy without makeup? I look tired. (laughs) I look sallow. I look like like a Victorian woman with consumption. I don't know, something like I look ill without it. I am going to tell you something vulnerable myself. Tell me. So I got a new phone and it has face ID. I haven't had face ID on my phone before. And I set it up last night Okay. and I did it last night. Like I was all ready to go to bed. I set it up. So I had on a skincare, but no makeup. Okay. I set it all up. This morning with makeup on, it does not wreck. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Yes. Then on top of it, my eight year old who sh- likes to share a bathroom with me in the morning came in to like do her hair and I was putting on makeup and she goes, wow, you look so much smoother <laughs> when you have on your makeup. <laughs> smoother. It's real talk. It's real talk. Thanks, Apple. Thanks, great. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, man. Like, honestly, in the morning when I look at myself, I'm like, girl, you look dead. You don't look well. Yeah. And I put makeup on and it's like, I feel like I'm bringing myself back to life. I do too. So it just made me laugh when she's like, you look too healthy. I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I know. You look too good with the makeup. <laughs> I know. And you know, when I went in for that sinus surgery, I was like, I'm just going to put on a little concealer. <laughs> a lip gloss. <laughs> of course I went in and they're like, they hand me the wipes, like take it all take off. Take it all <laughs> off, sister. <laughs> but still, I was like, just a little. <laughs> it helps my spirits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I guess in order to be believed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my God. So in direct foil to Dorothy, Blanche comes in looking like total hell. She's been up for 72 hours because she had a breakthrough, a mystical experience where words poured out of her. Okay, Jessica, you are a published author. Have you ever had like a breakthrough like this where you're just like writing through the night and the words are flowing and it's just all happening? No, staying up late on a roll possibly too close to deadline. Yes. Many of those, many of those. And I do think that there have been many moments because being a writer is its own kind of hell. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's the writing part. It's the writing part. Is that like when I've gotten in the flow, I don't want to stop and I'll get irritated to stand up and pee. Yes. Oh yeah. Standing up to pee, but like to get out of my seat and pee. (laughs) Or have to pick up kids or earn money or make dinner, whatever that is. I get irritated because I want to just keep going because I know once I break it, the cycle starts over and it's like hard to get back to it. It's the hardest thing. When you're in that mode, it's like you just want to shut the whole world out because it is a rare thing. So Mm -hmm. she's, she's had her breakthrough. She's at this point delirious. She's dramatic. After all this, she's like, I, I've decided I'm not going to sell my book because it's just too good. They can publish it after I'm dead. And, you know, a posthumous publish, like, sure, <laughs> cool. But this is a fun fact. This was actually Rue McClanahan's favorite episode ever because she loved being able to get like messy and ridiculous because, you know, she's always so pulled together uh, in her yes. Southern sexy way. Huh. How fun. That's, that's a good fun fact. Mm -hmm. Blanche forces Rose to read an excerpt of her book. I love this part. Oh my God. Rose is like, um, this is nonsensical. (laughs) This is 
ridiculous. And of course, Blanche blames it on her being from Minnesota and not being yeah. right. She doesn't get it because she didn't even know where her loins were. <laughs> I mean, she's the next Daniel Steele, right? Right. But Rose is like, um, no. <laughs> no. I loved it. Rose stood up for herself. She did. This was a this was a little um pep in her step, a little fire yeah. in Rose. Yeah. We don't get to see that too often either, but when we see it, we take it seriously. Yeah, yeah. So she puts Rose to bed. She's like, you're a crazy woman. You need to go to bed. <laughs> you need sleep. So, okay, we're now at Dr. Chang's office. And Sophia, oh, Sophia. This is the cringe. She's quick to inform Dr. Chang that she's just crazy about Chinese people. And she keeps interjecting her, her compliments. I'm going to say compliments and finger quotes here throughout the appointment about, you know, how wonderful and amazing Chinese people are. And he's like, okay, <laughs> okay, old lady. And she does get reprimanded by Dorothy. So I feel like we're in a moment in time where this is not okay, but it's really put off as like, Sophia's an old lady who says whatever she wants in a misguided way. Right. Right. Even though her intentions are absolutely like to be complimentary, she's not trying to offend, but yet it's offensive. But certainly we're in a different time. Oh, yes. Dr. Chang tells Dorothy that he doesn't agree with her previous doctor's findings because there are new diseases showing up all the time that we don't have tests for. And that doesn't mean... The diseases don't exist. Just because we can't test for them doesn't mean they don't exist. Right. This is shattering the doctor ego issue that she ran into. Yep. He believes Dorothy is suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. And he mentions that it's relatively new and that they're still learning a lot about it. And here's a fun fact. Chronic fatigue syndrome wasn't officially classified by the CDC until 1987. So this episode aired in 1989. So it really was kind of this like new new. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Chang can't tell her how long this will last, but he does assure her that there are lots of people living with this condition. And he then says, I think the most important thing in this whole episode, he says, many doctors tend to blame the patient when they can't definitively see what's going on under a microscope. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's been happening this whole time. And Dorothy is just so relieved. She's believed she's seen and her condition has a name and that's huge. She's like overjoyed. Series creator, Susan Harris wrote these episodes based on her own battle with chronic fatigue syndrome. Huh. So she told out.com that she's still affected by the condition today. Wow. Yeah. She says, it's something that some people get over and others don't. I'm better now than I was, much better than I was. For example, I used to be a runner, but I had to stop. Now I'm a walker. It's that kind of difference. That adds some import to the episode. And I don't know that like anyone was talking about this back then. I'm not just talking about chronic fatigue syndrome. I mean, just this issue of not being believed, particularly as a woman by your physician. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I had a client um, at one point who had chronic fatigue syndrome. She still does. And she worked for herself. She had to work for herself in part because of this. Mm-hmm. But, um, and she did these trainings and they were short term, like several days or like a training a week for several weeks or something like that, because it was the way that she could manage her illness. But she, when we started working together, she told me there might be days that I literally cannot talk to you because of what's going on. And there were times where she would go away for long periods of time because she was recovering and she did most of her business from her bed. And that was an interesting moment for me in working with her. First of all, in recognizing these issues around chronic fatigue still exist. And I think it's easy to think this is a mental health issue rather than like, this is a physical issue. And what else is going on? 
Like those are certainly thoughts I had in my head, although I believed her completely, but it was a good moment for me, I think, and her being forthright for me to just ask questions. What do you need from me? How can I respond? How can I help you to be more empathic about her situation, but also recognizing we don't know about this. Maybe do people hide it because there's still this conception about the disease that it's not real? I think they might, especially because people aren't inclined to believe that you're sick if you don't look sick. Mm -hmm. So if you don't look sick, what could possibly be wrong with you? And I'm so glad that your client was able to find ways to work around and still be able to bring in money. What happens to the people who don't have those skill sets? Like, what do you do? And this is a single woman. Her support system was critical for her and a very fiery woman. So it was very, it was interesting as well to observe the difference in her demeanor when she was having episodes, flare ups. I don't know what you call it, but Mm -hmm. when she was experiencing the fatigue and when she wasn't, it was, it was very interesting, but I was really glad that she was forthright with me so that I could show up and question my own immediate thoughts or, and be there to support her and not push her in a way that was uncomfortable. So that was a a learning for me. And that was only, that was a few years ago, but I think we kind of still have some of the same attitudes about it. If you heard of somebody having chronic fatigue syndrome now, what might your immediate honest reactions be? I think it's just not really understanding chronic fatigue. Yeah. You're chronically tired. Like I think a lot of people think, well, yeah, I mean, I'm tired too. People probably feel like they have to prove their symptoms to the world who doesn't understand them. Right. You know, it's heartbreaking. How difficult, like you have the energy to do that. You're just yeah. trying to make it through the day. Right. It's really debilitating. Now I kind of want to know more about the science of it. Mm -hmm. Like distress, amplify the symptoms and the issues, what causes it. And I'm curious, like, I'm really curious right now at this point in the pandemic and the COVID times, as we're talking about with the brain fog before, what is the stress of this time done to our bodies and made us more vulnerable to? Mm. That's Pandora's box, Jessica. That is a lot. And it's a little overwhelming to think about, Mm -hmm. but I'm curious in five years, where will people be simply from living through this time? We need a Sophia on our side. Yeah, we do. Not to make the racist comments, but to carry her purse with us into the, into the doctor. (laughs) Maybe it is, maybe watching this is a good opportunity to remember, like, how do you advocate for yourself and what kind of support do you have in advocating for yourself when you're experiencing something and not feeling you're getting the medical response you need? Right. And how are we showing up and advocating for the people in our lives who need that kind of support? And how do we teach our kids to advocate for themselves and not downplay what they're experiencing? Yeah, that's really hard when you're already feeling certain weird levels of shame or you're, you're questioning your own sanity how do you do that? I don't know. I don't know. What's the balance between telling, like, you know, when a kid is always like, oh, I have like, this spot and it hurts my finger or oh my God. You know, you're, like, you're fine. Oh, I have a cough. No, you're fine. You're going to school <laughs> with the other balance of like, you have a cough, you could have COVID. So I, maybe it is just a reminder to like, okay, acknowledge the symptoms. I believe you. I believe you, but you're also going to school. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Back at home, Blanche, she's just, she's so upset, Jessica. She has received another rejection letter and she's like, all I ever wanted to be was special. And I thought this would do it. And, you know, my looks have always made me special, but I need to be realistic. My beauty will only last another 20, maybe 30 years. (laughs) I love how she embraces her beauty, her sexuality. (laughs) She feels herself. I love that on every possible level. But to your point of what you were saying earlier, there was a TikTok that went viral last January about how the Golden Girls are the same age as the characters, you know, in the Sex and the City reboot and just like that. Okay. So the internet sleuths all came together, like the Golden Girls stands, everybody got together to figure out how old these ladies were. There's clues in certain episodes and sometimes these things contradict each other. So it's not 
it's not a perfect science, but during the first season, people have decided that Dorothy and Blanche were both 53 and Rose was 55. Now, these episodes are part of season five. So Blanche and Dorothy are now like 58, 59, and Rose is like 60, 61. But Blanche saying, I only have about 20 to 30 more years of my beauty, that that gets her to like 88 to 98 (laughs) tops. And she's worried about it. She needs something else to make her special. And this reminded me, it's so funny the things you remember. I saw this episode of Oprah like a hundred years ago where Sybil Shepherd was on. And she was saying like, it's a really weird thing when you grow up and you're beautiful. She had so much attention. And then once her beauty began to fade as per the standard of Hollywood or whatever that means, she was like, I don't know who I am anymore. If I'm not this beautiful woman who's looked at this certain way, I literally don't know who I am. And it took her on this like wild odyssey of like trying to discover who she actually was under all of that because she never had to. Mm -hmm. Beauty is such a weird thing. Oh, it's such a complicated web. And now that I'm 50, I really notice a shift in how I think about the way that I look, what I notice about the way that I look my compulsion towards filters. Do I want to filter? No, I'm okay. You know, but just like what I notice about how my face in particular is changing. I'm on the dating apps, not that successfully, but the minute I turned 50 plummeted in interest in matches plummeted. That's fascinating. And I am interested that I have received comments like, you look really great for your age. I mean, I always respond with, you could have just stopped with, you looked really great. That was the right answer. Mm -hmm. But it is a really interesting thing what that line means for women and how we are perceived. And my daughter's kind of astounded, I think that I'm 50, although we joke all the time that I'm 37, but she was telling her friends at school in second grade last year that I had turned 50. And and one of her friends said like, your mom looks 30 and it's the pink hair, you know, it's the pink hair I know. But anyway, I was like, oh, she's my new favorite. And then another friend goes, your mom looks really young, a lot younger. She looks like 47. (laughs) A lot younger, 47. Right. Although 47 does feel a little bit young right now, but anyway, it has been interesting. And I relate to the comment, not of being Hollywood standard, beautiful, but certainly have an understanding of what I look like and how that is shifting. And what does that mean that it's shifting and what do I want to do about it or not? I mean, I have an aunt who just died. She was 92, several facelifts, really? you know what? no makeup died looking really good. Oh, really good Mm -hmm. at 92. Great. Her skin, phenomenal wrinkles. Yes, but not very many. There are ways to look that way. It just depends on where are you empowered to make choices and changes and where, where is it more internal? And it's interesting. It's all so individual, but I just had a birthday two weeks ago. I turned 46 And it's a weird thing because I don't feel weird about turning 46, but at the same time, when I was 45, I felt so solidly middle-aged. I am middle-aged. 45 years from now, I will be 90. I could, I could make it to 90. I feel like I could make it to 90, God willing. Now that I'm 46, middle age is 92. The next half, it means I'm 92. Like, so I'm like doing this weird sort of math in my brain and it, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's this like weird mental game I'm playing. I don't feel 46. Sometimes I feel a hundred, but in my spirit, sometimes I feel so much younger. So it's weird. And then I look at like my mom, is this what my skin's going to look like? Is this what my face is going to look like? You start Mm -hmm. to look for clues in the older women around you and your family. And you're like, is this what my body's going to look like? Is this, you know, what my hands are going to look like as I get older? Yeah. It's fascinating. There is a TikTok creator who I really love who looked at ads. I think they're 
Are they clear all ads maybe from the early eighties and looking at the hairstyles of the women. And then she photoshopped in today's hairstyles to see, do the women look younger because she's kept saying it's all about the hair. It's all okay. the hair. And it's what made the difference. It was radical. It really sparked a great conversation about like the images that we have from different eras, from different decades where women looked older. Is it the hair? I have a photo on my wall of my grandmother. She must have been 60s, early 60s. I'm sitting on her lap and she is the stereotypical white haired granny with her hair in a bun. She looks beautiful. Her skin looks great. And she looks old. And I always thought of her as old. Obviously, she's my grandmother. However, I now have friends who are in their 60s who look far younger than that. Right. Is it the way they dress? Is it that they're not carrying $10 in a little thing hooked to their bra that you can see through their blouse? <laughs> is it there? Is it because they're not smoking? Is it because they're not smoking? Is it because we have better skincare? Is it because we have better drugs? I mean, it can be all kinds of things, right? But when I look at the Golden Girls now and I think those women are supposed to be a few years older than me. So the age of my friends and me, none of us look like that. I mean, and some of it's a style. We're not wearing dark pantyhose and flower dresses. Right. We don't have gray hair by choice. However, they look a lot older than we do. I want to believe it. They do look a lot older than we do. To your point and your pink hair, you know, forever young. I feel like even for the women who want to go gray, it's all about the style of the hair. It's not this tight curl sort. It's set. You know, it's like a set. it's a set, right? We go to the salon <laughs> once a week, they wash your hair and they set it. And then you, you just maintain right. that style all week long. Yes. It's very aging. But on the other hand, Golden Girls did something radical in embracing age. And at the time, maybe it was, that was the age that they could get away with on TV and still market to a wider audience without being too old lady. And they're still sassy. They're still sexual. They're still fun. They're still intellectual and progressive and political, but they're not, they're not too young and they're not too old. And so fifties felt like the age, like the safe age. Yeah. So it was radical then, right. For a mass market. Mm -hmm. But what about today? What if golden girls was on TV today? How old would the women be? Oh boy. I love any show that features women of a certain age. We don't see it enough. This is why I want my older housewives. We want to see women living their life, having fun, having adventures, having friendships, relationships, fighting. We want to see it all. There's not a lot of places to be able to see that kind of programming, whether it's scripted or reality. I just want to see older women. I've always been attracted to older love stories. Hmm. Is Grace and Frankie, what is that? Frankie and Oh Grace? yeah, Grace and Frankie. Or Fra- Grace and Frankie. Grace That's and Frankie. like a good equivalent, right? Yes. Like I love second act stories. Me too, because it's like, don't give up. <laughs> no, because they're so much richer. There's yeah. no delusion. Like you are who you are at this time in your life and right. you know what you want. And if you can make that work with another person, like that's truly beautiful to me. Those are the best stories. Yeah, I'm probably the worst person to watch Virgin River, a Hallmark movie, or like a cheesy rock. Cause I'm like, they'll be divorced. In five yeah, years. that's or, not going to last. I give them 11 years. <laughs> I'm like, professionally speaking, my assessment is this will come up in your divorce proceedings. That's what I'll be thinking. Mm-hmm. Back to the Grace and Frankie. In the show, are they in their 70s? I think they're in their 70s. Yeah. Okay. So that is a big boost 20 years. They're having relationships. They're having sex. They have businesses. They're entrepreneurial. They're on madcapped adventures. They're crazy. They're having fun. One who's had all the cosmetic work done. Right. Bless her heart. Looks amazing. Mm -hmm. And another who hasn't and looks amazing. Right. Okay. I think this is our modern day golden girls. I love it. Until we begin to live our own 
golden girl's existence. <laughs> right. When we get wise, get golden, whatever you say. <laughs> yes. And in fact, Jessica, I had a Rue McClanahan sighting. <gasps> You saved it to uh, this, like we're an hour in. And- yeah, I saved the best for last. So I was, you know, a theater nerd in high school and we used to go to Samuel French in Hollywood to just buy scripts. And it was just like this really cool thing we used to go do. And we were there and in walks Rue fucking McClanahan. And I was like, oh, because at that time, I think it had just ended maybe two years before that or something like that. And we couldn't believe it. And I mean, there's literally nothing more to that story. No one dared go talk to her. It wasn't the day of taking a selfie with your phone. I didn't ask her for an autograph, but we were just like, oh my God. I love that. That's a good story. That's That's a very good story. These are really good episodes. I really did laugh out loud. I think... It would be fun to go back and watch more Golden Girls. That was a good lesson. Like a lot of the humor stood up. It did. And I was trying to like remember backstory. There was a lot of things I didn't remember, but I feel like Rose's husband died when they were having sex. And that was like the one thing I remember about their backstories. Is this true or did I make it up? I remember one of them that happened. Now I have to do some investigating. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, there was a spinoff to the show called The Golden Palace. I watched one episode and I was like, this is terrible. Don Cheadle's in it. Oh. They like manage a hotel. Oh, no. So Blanche, all upset, rejection letter. Rose is like, Blanche, beauty comes from within, blah, 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 you know, whatever. That's the end of that storyline. And we then see the ladies all dressed up for dinner at a fancy restaurant. Their fancy clothes were funny to me. (laughs) Like old lady fancy clothes. Yeah. I know. Dorothy ever flowy. It always floats away from the body. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So Dorothy is just in the best spirits ever. She orders the best champagne that the restaurant has because it's her treat. And this is a celebration. She says, I can't believe what a relief it is to just be sick rather than sick and crazy. She then spots Dr. Bud, the neurologist. Lo and behold. From New York. Yes. A very fancy restaurant. Dorothy's like, I need to go talk to this asshole. She goes right over. And you know, the first thing I noticed who he's sitting with, his wife with the blonde hair. Mm -hmm. So she tells Dr. Bud that she has chronic fatigue syndrome. He acknowledges her relief at her official diagnosis, only to then go on and try to dismiss her again. Like, oh, well, nice seeing you. And Dorothy's like, no, no, no. Not having it. This is this is where her teacher side comes out. She's like, oh, no, I have the energy for this shit. Right. So she gets emotional. She tells him, I came to you sick, sick and scared, and you dismissed me. You made me feel crazy, like I made it all up. Is that your caring profession? Is that healing? No one deserves that kind of treatment. I suspect if I had been a man... I might have been taken a bit more seriously and not told to go to a hairdresser. That's right. She's the feminist of 1989. Totally. Yeah. Totally. That series on today.com, they found that 17% of women and 6% of men reported being treated differently by a medical provider because of gender. Hmm. So women are reporting this, you know, three times as often as men. I bet it's higher. I do too. Dorothy asks him when he lost his humanity as a doctor. Mm -hmm. This was her mic drop, right? She tells him, I hope that if you ever find yourself sick one day, that you have a doctor who's better than you. Damn. We can't forget to mention that he tries to interrupt her at one point and his wife is like, "Mm -mm, you listen up. Sister power. I know she's like, I have blonde hair. I still hate this person. (laughs) Yes. So Dorothy has her moment, right? She returns to the table. She's completely triumphant. 
The ladies toast to their friendship and they sip that delicious bottle of champagne. And this is when Rose is like, oh, this is a $430 bottle of champagne. (laughs) Dorothy panics. She's like, I can't afford it. Oh my God. So quick thinking, Sophia, she's got a little trick up her sleeve. She pours some salt into the champagne and she takes a sip and she spits it out. And the waiter comes rushing over and, oh my God, this is a bad bottle. Oh, we're so sorry. We'll comp your meal. And so they get this fancy meal for free. In a turn of the universe, they get their meal for free. In terms of Dorothy having chronic fatigue syndrome, it's actually never brought up in the series again after these two episodes. So it's not like it was this big like through line throughout the rest of the series. They didn't graze anatomy it. (laughs) (laughs) I was looking up this episode because it's on like a bunch of lists of like iconic, important episodes from this time. And medium.com said this episode, even all this time later, it's like, you know, 30 some odd years later, it still resonates deeply with people who suffer from chronic illness. This is an episode that really is meaningful to people. Mm. They still talk about it. They still think about it. They're still thankful for it, that it's out there. And that's really fascinating, Mm -hmm. isn't it? And also just, it tells you like sitcom of the time, how the big issues were handled. At the time, was it radical then to like bring up an issue and then never go back to it? This sort of was in the era of like the very special episode where you've got your funny shows and then they tackle this like really deep, dark thing. Like we covered different strokes where Arnold was almost molested. That episode will never leave my brain. Oh my God. But I'm also thinking of like 90210. There's oh, yeah. eating disorders, drug use, sexual assault, all these things covered. But then they just move on to prom. They just move on to prom and Kelly's coke addiction. And then there's a fire. And it like it's right. just like these kids have been through so much. Yeah. Maybe it was more like Dawson's Creek era when things started having a through line. Mm-hmm. This is something to explore on a deeper level. On a dissertation. Yes. Someone (laughs) could do a thesis on this easily. When did the through line of major social issues or major personal... When did it begin? When did it begin and where are we today? I assume, much like the show's creator for the Golden Girls, that Dorothy probably just learned how to manage her condition. She did. She was fine. Maybe not fine, fine, but like she's living with it and thriving in spite of it, right? Yeah, probably she got booted from her job for being too old and having gray hair. Oh, anyway. <laughs> which is a whole other issue. That's a different episode, Jessica. Sick and tired and unemployed. <laughs> when it comes to healthcare, though, I found an article published by Northwell Health and the Katz Institute for Women's Health. They said that there's a dirty little secret in healthcare that doesn't get the attention it deserves. Female patients are continuously gaslighted about their physical and mental health. And they went on to say that like the standard of care is basically all about treating women like little men when symptoms and conditions present differently between men and women. They said, quote, we can't blindly expect women to conform to a male model of health. We now know that male and female physiology differs well beyond the body parts covered by a bathing suit. And I think that's just so important because these studies, they focus so much on men and they often leave women out of the equation. And if it can have really dangerous consequences, they actually offered suggestions for what women should do in the event that they feel like their doctor is gaslighting them through dismissive attitudes, interruptions, condescending remarks, and subtle persuasion. They say, speak up, get a second opinion, and ask to be referred to a specialist that offers a multidisciplinary approach to patient care. So this is when like teams come together to review patient cases where you have specialists And they're coming together with their different experiences to try to find solutions for patients trying to offer diagnosis and treatment options rather than one person having like the definitive say. That's really empowering language to have. Mm -hmm. How would you know? 
I think we have to say out loud, though, that if we truly had women centered health care where women are believed and trusted about their own bodies and their own lives, reproductive issues would not be under governmental control. It's a symptom of a much larger system where women are not valued in health care. Women's experiences and their own understanding of themselves are not valued. And it truly isn't a partnership between many women and their doctors. It is a management issue. And that is so scary. It is very scary. So on that happy note, the Golden Girls, like we said, aired for seven seasons, ran from 1985 to 1992, 180 episodes. I mean, that is amazing. It is amazing. It won all the things. It won two primetime Emmys. It won three Golden Globes. Each cast member won an Emmy Award. That's very rare. That's only happened Mm. a few times. And in 2013, TV Guide ranked the Golden Girls number 54 on its list of the 60 best series of all time. I loved it. It honestly made me want to watch more. Me too. It felt really comforting. Yeah. You know, we all yeah. have our comfort TV shows. It felt cozy. Cozy is a good word. And I think if we have a takeaway, because we have covered a lot of like really scary, disconcerting things about healthcare. It is, and this is something I tell my clients all the time when they're going through divorce. If you find yourself at a life transition and you don't have a doctor who you can speak to honestly about it, who's going to support you and what you know about yourself, it is time to find a new doctor and start by asking all your girlfriends who they go to. And I do think that that is like, it is a takeaway of all these big topics is that how critical, especially as we age, it is to have in our support circle, doctors, professionals, caregivers who really see us and hear us. My TED talk. It's so important. And even in your work as a divorce coach, that translates to an attorney yeah, who really gets sure. you, right? Yeah. A divorce coach who really gets you, a therapist who really gets you, your support all around you. It's not just your medical doctor. A podiatrist. A pod- <laughs> <laughs> yes, a podiatrist. If nothing else. You're going to get plantar fasciitis. You <laughs> are. going to happen. <laughs> You're not crazy. It's not all in your head. Especially if you don't wear those old lady like Clarks or something. (laughs) You will get it. We love some orthopedic comfort around here. It's you wear high heels all the time for you. Not anymore. Oh my God, Jessica. I don't. And I did wear them for a few days in a row. And that's what led to my (laughs) plantar fasciitis. And the podiatrist was like, "Mm -mm." it's over. It's over. (laughs) Party's not over. It's just different. It's just wedge heel. Oh, okay. (laughs) So Jessica, you're a divorce coach. What's new and exciting for you? What's going on? It is busy. You know, COVID has really changed how women are evaluating who they are in their home and what they want for their, their lives. And so it's busy right now, which is a good thing. I think not, I think some people think of that as like, oh, divorce is up. Some reports saying 25 to 30% since March, 2020, and that that's a scary, bad thing. I think is a really empowering thing for women to be able to assess what they want for this part of their lives and the next. Um, If we're talking about golden girls and golden times, finding support in that transition is really important. I am so excited to be on TikTok every single day, talking about issues of divorce, connecting with so many people. I have a lot of men out very angry about what I'm saying, but I have way more women who are showing up and interacting with the content. It's thrilling. And so if you're wanting to find good advice about divorce changes in relationships, man, TikTok is a place. It's a place to be. Where can people find you on TikTok? What's your handle? I'm at Divorce Coach for Moms. I do two videos a day. So you can always find me there. And there's just a lot of other good related content. And particularly, I think for women over 40, there is a great segment of content for women over 40, really empowered in being single, um, in living your best life, in 
trusting yourself. And so that is shifting and good to, to pay attention to every day. Oh, I love that. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me, especially to talk about the Golden Girls. Thank you. It's my pleasure. You always bring up like a blast from the past that I am so excited to revisit. Well, you are truly golden. You're golden to my heart and I love you so much. And I I just can't thank you enough as always. Stay golden, Lori. (laughs) Stay golden. And patrons, you stay golden. Thank you for listening and supporting the podcast. Just a friendly reminder, you can find us online at the Untitled Gen X Podcast.com and of course on the socials. We hope you keep in touch, beautiful people. Bye.